of CP Ontario. Now again, there's certain exceptions to that rule. So when you're looking for employment and that kind of thing, obviously you want to tell people that you have membership in a distinguished accounting body outside Canada, but you just have to be careful. So if you have any questions about that in terms of specifics, you can contact us and we can um, forward the email to our legal department so you can get the exceptions and make sure that you're on board with all the rules and that kind of thing, okay? And to be fair, most people don't know that. So that's one of the reasons why we talk about it. Um, and so when we start getting information, you know, emails from people during their student process and we start to see email signature blocks with designations, they just get a gentle reminder that says, hey, you probably didn't know this, but you can't really be using this right now. And so that's all, okay? Uh, another benefit to membership in CP Ontario is all of our mutual recognition agreements with accounting bodies around the world. So we have quite a few agreements with different uh, accounting bodies, not just memorandums of, of understanding, but actual mutual recognition agreements where you may not even have to do an exam or maybe just a quick conversion exam depending on which accounting body it is. So if you like to travel the world, um, this may be something that interests you. And uh, sort of going hand in hand with the first two bullets, job opportunities and having a competitive advantage in the workplace of having the local designation, right? Hi. Yeah, I have a question in context to MRAs. Yes. Uh, because in case of MOU, we did not finish the program originally from start to finish. Mm -hmm. So we are but would you still be eligible? Going the other way around, yes. like uh, in any designation from a country, like you mentioned, that must be original country they from the start to finish rather than on a country balance basis. That's a really good what question. So would it be applicable? Yes. So that's, that's a really good question, and I'm going to be honest. We are currently renegotiating all of our agreements because uh, it's a brand new world with our uh, unification of the three accounting bodies. So somebody who, for example, finished the old leg CCA program and has a CPACA designation, they can um, apply to the MRAs with the legacy CAs, but they can't apply through the CGA or CMA MRA agreements because they didn't do those old legacy programs. The, the agreements were based on the legacy programs. So right now they're all being renegotiated by our national body. So Generally speaking, it usually means that you have to have completed, at the very least, the final examination, which you would be doing with the CP, but these other accounting bodies are not familiar with our new program anyway, which is why they're all, one of the reasons why they're all being renegotiated. So uh, this is something that, you know, yeah. is going to have to be reviewed and renegotiated and whatnot. Exactly. In case specifically, Cynthia, I had a look at SICA, which is South African Institute of Science. Mm -hmm. The same thing goes over there. If you complete it originally from start to finish, then you get the exemption. But sometimes from start to finish, yeah. yeah. So sometimes not. Like, for example, uh, we have candidates who come in from, I'm trying to think, um, what an example would be, England and Wales sometimes, the Institute of Chartered Accounts in England and Wales. They'll come to us, and for whatever reason, they may have been exempted from the first few examinations, but they wrote the last one or the last two. And at CP Ontario, the registrar has always said, okay, well, they finished the qualifying exam, therefore they're fine, and we let them in, assuming all other requirements were met, obviously. Um, so it could be the same, but that's something that needs to be ironed out with our national body, okay? And one of the things that they are looking at, obviously, is making sure that all of our members are eligible at some point for some of these mutual recognition agreements. So we currently have legacy CGAs, and we have legacy CMAs, and we have legacy CAs. And they all want access, and right now they don't because the mutual recognition agreements were based on the legacy programs. So that's something that's being worked out so that maybe there's a bridging program or something, but that's in talks. That's beyond our level. That's all negotiated at the national level with CPA Canada. Okay? Yes? So the first point, permitted to use CPA designation in Ontario. Yes. Does it mean they can use the designation only in Ontario or outside Ontario also? Uh, 
that's a really good question. So the membership that you gain, if you complete our program and are admitted to membership, you are eligible to use it in Ontario. If you move across Canada, um, then you would just need to register with that province. So perhaps you like the weather better in British Columbia, they have milder winters, and then you can just transfer your membership. So it's just a matter of filling out some forms and paying the annual membership dues. You can maintain your membership here or resign it, but um, it's, it's, you don't have to re-qualify as long as you were in good standing at the time that you applied to another province. And the really weird news is, is that Bermuda is considered another Canadian province for the purposes of accounting. I know, I started working here, I was like, what? I remember that in geography class. Um, so it's, um, the program is the Canadian CPA program. So that means we consider it another province and all the mutual recognition agreements that we sign across Canada includes Bermuda. Um, so um, yeah, if you decide you want to go to Bermuda, you can transfer your membership without requalifying. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> Or one more question yes. on the same uh, designation. So my understanding is that if you forego the capstone modules through the MRA, you get to use the CPSCA, the legacy title. But if you go through the capstone one, two, and then the CFE, then you're just allowed to use CPA. Is that? Okay, I'm not like, sure I'm understanding you. Under the new move with ICAP, there is no eligibility for the legacy CA designation. So anybody who registers effective April when we when we made this official at CP Ontario, any registration that's received, anybody who completes the process, whether or not they do the capstones, only come out with a CPA designation. Our legacy program ended in the beginning of 2015, but we kept it in with the MOU agreements and with our MRA agreements until they renegotiated simply because it wasn't fair to those people. It was officially in the documents, so we wanted to give it out, but those were the only people that were coming into the program and coming out with a legacy CA designation. So uh, as everything gets renegotiated, and this is the first one to be renegotiated, uh, it's only the CPA program. And existing students who you may know people who are currently in the program under the old new in the legacy CA program they can continue but if they decide they want to go right to the CP without doing the capstones then that puts them under the new move and they lose their right to have the CA designation after um, admission okay good questions all good questions Okay, important information. So obviously you're all here, but in case you know people who haven't yet moved to Ontario, you can actually start the student registration process before coming to Canada. Um, everything is available online. Uh, everything I'm telling you for the most part is available on our website. We've updated it to include the new information. Registration forms module zero even is available to you if your student registration is approved before coming to Canada, okay? But you do need to be in Canada in order to attend the modules and obviously to write the exams. Unfortunately, we don't offer the exams in other countries. I know some accounting bodies have like satellite locations and whatnot, we don't. So you need to be in Canada for that. So I have mentioned a couple times, we do have a, a pretty good uh, website. I say that because I've written some of it. Uh, for internationally trained accountants. Um, so if you click on become a CPA and why a CPA, um, and then internationally trained accountants, you can select your county body. In this case, you'd select ICAP, and uh, you actually don't select the words in the Institute of Chartered Accounts of Pakistan. You click on the designation. Uh, the reason for that is, and you'll see when you pull up the table, some accounting bodies have more than one pathway. Um, so if you were to just click on the accounting body, it wouldn't really clarify that. So uh, you would click on CPA and it would take you right to the page with all the information about the new MOO and all the registration forms and instructions for that. Okay? And I've sort of given you a lot of information, some of which I think you knew and some of which you didn't. 
So if we don't, if you think of questions after I've left, uh, or you want to provide more information, some people are shy and don't want to get into their personal situation in public, that's fine. Uh, you can send us an email. We have uh, a relatively new email address that's specific to internationally trained accountants. So it comes directly to the area in which I work in the registrar's office. It's ITA registration at cpaontario.ca. And uh, if you can include your name, your accounting body, and your specific questions, that would be awesome. You'd be surprised how many times people forget to include their name or where they're from. So <laughs> that would just help us counsel you a little bit better. Okay. And in addition to our website, um, I found uh, a few months ago I, a resource on our, on our national body's website. It's called The Guide to Accounting Business Culture Adapting to the Canadian Accounting Workplace. Now, I'm sure most of you are already employed, and that's great, but if you uh, want some additional information or you know people who aren't yet employed or are making way to move to Canada, this may be something that they're interested in. It's an online interactive course designed for internationally trained accountants working or seeking work in accounting. Because sometimes when you land here, you're working to pay bills, but it's not your preferred job, right? So um, it was apparently created with input from both employers and internationally trained accountants, which is awesome. And the guide uh, was created to help new Canadians create effective accounting resumes. And as I'm sure you've learned that resume uh, writing is very different here than it is around the world. Um, preparation for interviews and understanding Canadian workplace norms, which, you know, is great. It's free for registered students, um, so that's great. And it's available to others for a nominal fee. I looked into that because I was curious what nominal meant. And um, I think it's like $20, $25, so it actually is nominal. Did <laughs> uh, you hear that for me? Uh, so for information on how to register for that particular course, you can contact our national body, CPA Canada. They have a specific department called the Professional Learning and Development Customer Service. That's a mouthful. Um, the short is PLD at cpacanada.ca. And they also have a phone number if you want to write that down. I'll just give you a second. Hi. Hi, yeah. Uh, I've got two quick questions for you. Uh, so firstly, uh, as we just saw about the master's degree, so what kind of evidence uh, do we have to provide if we have a master's degree? Because I've been having some back and forth with CPA because sometimes they say that ICAP has to, uh, you know, endorse the masters, or sometimes they say it's that you can provide the West. So assessment. I, I, yeah. 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 Okay, that's a good question. Uh, these are questions we pose to our national body, who created this agreement. They're still working it out. In the meantime. Uh, I can tell you what we do for other people and what we would do until we formalize a plan. And that is, if you have an original West assessment, that would be great. We only take originals. Uh, if you want the original return to you, just include a cover letter and we will return it to you. Um, we're also looking for your resume. Um, and yeah, uh, if you have your original transcripts, you can send those in and we'll return them. Or if you happen to be in the neighborhood, I have internationally trained accounts come in all the time and rather than leave their transcripts with us, we'll photocopy them, either myself, one of my colleagues, or even our receptionist is, is trained on this when I'm not available. Um, and we photocopy them and we have a special stamp that indicates we've seen the originals. So when the registrar is reviewing your application, he knows that you just didn't submit photocopies, that somebody saw the original. I mean, we're not obviously attesting to its authenticity, but we're attesting to the fact that it was an original document and and that has worked for other applications. So that would be fine as well. Yeah. So sorry, I submitted my uh, <laughs> online through email and it did, didn't ask uh, for on, uh, Okay. Email. And you're applying under the new move. Yeah. So, and did you get any feedback at all? Yeah, they said that the documentation is has been forwarded to the registrar. So probably. Oh, okay. So it came through customer service, and now it's in presumably a queue with my area. So I have two people I work with who are responsible for getting those emails, printing them out, and preparing them for the registrar. So at some point, you should be receiving something that talks about original documentation. But it's possible because this is new, and you're going to be one of the first people applying under the new. Uh, agreement that um, 
it just hasn't been followed up yet. So the other possibility is if you don't have a degree, we can look at your resume to see if you have the five years post qualification, right? So. And uh, there's another question. So for, I mean, the day one is based on capstone one, I believe. So if we skip the capstone, how are we gonna? That's a good question. So my understanding is, is that when you, I believe, and this is something that we can double check um, as you move through the process. I believe that when you register for the CV, you're supposed to select some information about the depth uh, that you're choosing. Um, so that might have something to do with it. So we might be selecting a case. So we're not putting you at a, a specific disadvantage just because you're not writing the capstones, but they'll be, our education department is aware of this and they just, I don't think they've just filtered that information to us. I do know that when you register for the CP, you're supposed to choose your depths at that time so that they know, um, but there's probably more information about that mm -hmm. then. I would like to add something more. I have spoken to education department about this thing. And they told that uh, they will be providing you with that uh, case oh. on which you have to go for a gap. Okay, so we can Absolutely. select before. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they will be providing you that case, oh, that's which great. is actually being tested. Okay, that's great. Okay. Yeah, so actually, so, this was one of the questions that someone asked me, and uh, he couldn't be here. But the specific question was if someone opts for not writing Capstone 1, mm -hmm. And for day one, uh, will he or she be given that case? Yes. Uh, so yeah. this gentleman has just mentioned, and that right. does sound like something that would be yeah. um, accurate. So um, he's saying that you would be provided with a case. Obviously, it wouldn't be your case because you didn't do caps on one, but it would be a case that you would use for day one of the CV. Or will it be the same case the same. that will be used in day one, basically? Right? Yeah. But a different with different case facts. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Just like I think that's how it works normally because they test a different case in the exam. In, in the it's the same company. Almost uh, different issues, but same food, everything, yes. uh, the same business, but they take you far ahead. That, like they, yeah. uh, when they you start the case, capstone one, you're given uh, your, the company's working in 2017. But when you're given the case on day one, the company's far ahead in 2020. Yes, I mean, th that's a normal way. That's how yeah, they yeah. do it. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah. Uh, I have a question regarding the one. Somebody opts to uh, prepare for the capstone one. Mm -hmm. So, as for the new room, you don't have to uh, take the uh, capstone one and capstone two to sit for the CP. But okay. somebody say is opting to sit for the yep. capstone one. But as for MOU, he doesn't have to pass capstone one. But right. if he's opting to sit for capstone, does he have to pass capstone one and two to sit for CP, or he can directly do it? He can CP? just. Do it, yeah. So that's what's been done in the past. We have other people who are uh, in from other accounting bodies where they may have started further along in the process, and we've always allowed them to go back if they so choose. Very rarely does someone ask, but once in a while they do. And basically, I think the term is they audit the course, which means they can take the course because they want to brush up on whatever subject it is, but they're not required to pass it. And I believe it would be the same for the capstones, right? Because it's technically not required for you to pass. You're just Thank doing you. it to help yourself. Thank you. Right? I can double check if you want, but um, that's that would be my understanding because literally it's not in the MOU agreement. So, you know, if you just want to help yourself by by yeah, joining yeah, the whole point is to prepare for the CP. That's right. But if it's gonna hamper us in sitting then, the CP, then you're gonna think twice. Exactly. 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 That's the point. Yeah. 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 So the capstone capstone one structure is like that. You are divided into teams. Yes. So if it's not if it's optional on you, then uh, you are not going to sit for that one. And the other members like you are assessed as a team. Yes. Well, the board report is. I'm sure there's other. I I, I haven't done it, and I understand there's a panel that's going to come up later that's going to talk about it a little bit more in detail. But yes, if there's a, a large component is group work. 
Um, so you would obviously want to participate because it helps you learn and to brush up on your knowledge. And at the same time, if you, you're participating with your group, um, but for whatever reason, should any your uh, for some reason you don't do well in this, either because you're not with a good group or whatever, then it shouldn't matter for you because you're not required to pass capstone one. Okay, but. Remember that registration takes place much earlier because we need to know to put you into those groups and and whatnot. So, yeah, a lot of thought and detail goes into preparing people for the capstone. So our learning department needs that uh, that time to put everything together. Yes. As you said, that we have to pass the PT there in three attempts. Yes. No, no. So if you take a year off for whatever reason, you get busy, you have family, you can wait as long as you do it within your student registration timeline. All students are given a maximum number of years to complete the program, and that varies depending on um, certain elements. It's usually about eight or ten years, something like that. So you've got time. But um, no, they're definitely the rule is not three consecutive years. It's how three years. Because hmm? how much years are passing for the uh, I guess we have ten years? How often do we offer the capstone? No, how much uh, maximum time do you have? Oh, um, that's a good question. I don't know the specific answer to that one, uh, especially in light of the new move. No one has highlighted that. Um, it should be any. You should be considered the same maximum registration time as somebody who's entering the PEP program. Students who come in through what we call our preparation or preparatory courses have a different type of timeline because they're doing a lot more before they begin the actual program. My understanding is you would be considered a, a PEP student and therefore you should have around the same timeline for registration and off the top of my head I can't remember what that would be. Seven years. Seven years? Okay. It was a, uh, another program, evaluation of experience program. So how much? Sorry, the evaluation of experience. Yeah. Okay. So, the one, e. so how successful was that one, and why was that successful? Uh, okay. And is there any plan in future? Good questions. I um, it's been a while since I've got one of those questions. Uh, yes, the E was a program that we did offer for a few years. Um, there were a lot of issues with it, um, mostly because I think the program was good in its idea, but trying to execute it was a little more difficult. You know, they would certain things weren't easily defined. Senior level experience. Well, what is that? And certain, so it became an issue. So it was um, uh, something that became hard to to do. Um, the other program, the other reason is simply that it was modeled after the UFI, and the UFI hasn't been around for a few years. So um, if they develop it again, um, I heard a rumor that they may, but there's so many other agreements that our national body needs to work out first, all these mutual recognition agreements and our move with um, ICAI. Um, those obviously are very important, and those are worked out by our national body as well. So. If something like that happens again in the future, it would be redeveloped based on the new CPA program, which is the new CFI. So that would take some time. So if there are plans, I don't know when it would be. Um, people talk, but I, I know once in a while somebody says, I know somebody went through the Eve, is that coming back? It's, it's been disbanded for, when did it end, 2015? 2014, 2015? So it's been a few years already. Um, so I, I don't know. I just know that there are a lot of agreements that our national body needs to work out first. And um, so this is certainly a great opportunity to go right to the CP with optional capstones. Um, it's, um, you know, capstones help prepare you for the CP. And even if you didn't want to do it, if you know people have taken the CP, you could take study groups, you know, this is something that is really, we're very excited about. 
to offer that these two account our two accounting bodies have come together and worked this out uh, we're excited so this is what's available now and it's a lot shorter and it's available right now so hopefully this is something you'll want to pursue yes uh, as you mentioned uh, regarding the decision for examination that uh, for students in certain grades too they can be disciplined the examination however they uh, even if the assessment is in I'm sorry okay and you mentioned that uh, when a student submits the documentation and his documentation is under assessment yes he can still go for the registration of examination okay Yes, so not the student registration, if that's pending register approval, you can't do anything at that point. But if we're assessing, if we're doing a detailed experience assessment because for whatever reason you didn't meet the um, entry requirements for exemption from the experience, you didn't have two years post-qualification experience plus a degree or five years post-qualification experience because you didn't have a degree, if for some reason you didn't meet that, and we needed to do a detailed assessment of your experience, you are absolutely eligible to register for any module or exam while you wait. Okay? Because sometimes it can take several months, right? We do them as, a, as they come in, in order of which they arrive. So, you know, if somebody submits, completes their application and now they're ready to be assessed, and then you submit yours next month, and in the meantime, we've got 30 others, those, you know, that we do them in the order in which they're received to be fair, um, and they do take some time. The registrar meets once a month to review all of these requests. We have a sit-down meeting, and we just pour over the applications, and he goes through the experience and tells us, and we do up the decision letters, and he signs them, and out they go, but um, it, it can take some time, right? So, so just in case, uh, if the assessment takes longer time, and uh, is that the decision about the exam? So that's what I'm saying. You're, you're not held up from doing any of the modules or the exam while we do the detailed assessment of your experience. If you met the requirements when you came in as a student and you met those experience requirements where you have the two years and a degree or no degree in five years, then there's nothing to be done later. We would send you your student confirmation form saying you've been approved for registration, assuming you met all of the requirements, right, you're in good standing, all that stuff. Um, and then we'd say you've been exempted from the experience requirement and you're done. And then you just do the exam. But um, if for some reason we needed to do the detailed assessment, then that's gonna take some time and we do not hold you back while we're getting to it or while you're getting the forms ready, right? If you're in the middle of preparing for the seat fee, you're probably not gonna to wanna to start contacting old employers to get us the forms we need. You're gonna focus on the seat fee and that's fine. It's not gonna hold you back, okay? You just can't register for anything unless you're a registered student and that makes sense, right? You need the ID number and all that stuff, so, yes. So. A couple of questions actually. Uh, do you also require references with the resume when we submit uh, the resume? Evidence, as in like employer letters, that kind of thing. We're references. still working out the finer details. Right now, I think what we're saying is a resume, um, and that's what we're taking. But again, we haven't processed any yet, so um, that'll be for sure a registered decision. So what we're telling people is, and what we have on our website is what we're asking for, and if it is decided that we need a little bit more, we contact you. Um, okay. yeah. And uh, if you meet the requirements for exemption from practical experience, do we still need to fill in the PR form that uh, you would normally? Uh, PR form? The practical experience requirement form? Oh, yeah, uh, no, no. That's only required for detailed assessments, okay? So, uh, like, is this program designed in a way that if I start Capstone 1 in, in May, uh, can I go through the CFE until September? Or yes. It's designed it to, to be, it was built to be um, intertwined, I guess. You literally flow from one into the other into the seat. So, I'm not sure the exact date is Module 1 ends. I think it's uh, early to mid-July and you won't have much time off before you start Capstone 2, and then you won't have much time off before the CP takes place. Um, they, they were designed to be integrated 
on purpose because you know once you get into you know I don't want to say schooling but you know study and all that stuff you don't want to break out of that cycle and then wait several months and write an exam when it was designed to be that way okay we believe that that's going to help with success yes. uh, thanks for your patience with the question I just have a quick personal question so I my uh, uh, complete application was submitted like end of April should I expect to be registered before 31st May for to appear in the next attempt, or I mean, uh, given the you volume, expect? I mean, given the volume of work, you guys. That's a loaded question. <laughs> um, so I think you said eight to something weeks, eight to twelve weeks, something like that. So it's possible you could be. It is also possible you may not be. So what I'll do is I'll take your information before I leave and I'll look into it, see where it's at, because especially if it went to customer service um, and not through the ITA, uh, then it, sometimes it takes a while to filter its way to us. So I'll check in on it. If you can write down your full name and your email address and your phone number, I'll take it with me when I go. Okay. And I think you had a guess. Um, if you want to ask about it, um, I've asked for my little good family from my here. Mm -hmm. And they said that it might take a you know, few weeks before it arrives here, uh, two weeks or maybe eight to ten working days. Uh, so can I apply for registration for CP before it arrives or I have to wait for that? That's a good question. So, well, right now, if you were to submit your application for student registration, I can guarantee you there's no way, unfortunately, that it would be reviewed and approved before our May 31 deadline. We're sitting at May 16 right now. Um, and not only would we have to go through it and hopefully approve it, then we'd have to update our system and then you'd have to go online and register for the CP. And that's, I don't want to say, it's just not reasonable timeline for everyone concerned. So you could try, but honestly, I, I didn't come here today assuming anyone was going to try for this year's CP. Um, and I apologize if that's what you were hoping. I, I always hate to be the bearer of bad news. You, you can try. You've got the ITA website email, and certainly your subject line should be something that would get our attention very quickly, like CP registration or something like that. Uh, but um, in the sense that you know you would still have the opportunity to apply for a license if that's what you wanted. We're just working out the details of what those requirements would be for individuals such as yourself. Um, that has to be approved by our public accounts council, whatever. So I would imagine some kind of bridging program, but again, I'm not involved in those details. But the main issue for people is whether or not they want to keep the legacy to CA designation. Some people, it's very dear to their hearts and they won't give it up, and other people just want a designation and the faster the better. So I just want to make sure that people are aware of that they're making that choice because you can't ever go back. Is there a fee to ask for exemptions? Yeah. Yes. No, no, it's just if you switch over, then you just pay for what you're doing. So the CP, yeah. So you're saving money from the capstones by not writing them, but yeah, we're not going to charge you for, for not writing them yet. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for your patience and your uh, attention. Uh, I enjoyed uh, being here tonight, so I'm going to hand it over now to our panel, I guess. Uh, thank you, Alison. Uh,